All right, well, with the roaring having subsided, that's as good of an introduction and as, as appropriate as one could get for um, this morning's event. So I'm Dr. Anthony Fiorillo, Tony, um, and I am the executive director of this museum. And thank all of you for coming today for what we feel is a pretty exciting announcement, which because we're now actually a few minutes late, the embargo lifted at nine o'clock. Um, <clears throat> so I welcome you. If you haven't been here before, I hope this isn't the last time you're here. And um, so let's get started. We are the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. We are part of the Department of Cultural Affairs. We're very proud of the fact that we're a museum that serves all of New Mexico. And it's really terrific to see people around the state come here to learn about and celebrate New Mexico's natural heritage. And today we're gonna to talk about New Mexico's newest dinosaur. This, but before we get too far along, this discovery does not happen in isolation. We have several people to thank. First of all, it's not just me. There are a couple of other researchers on this project behind me. There are nine people on the paper that we're gonna talk about today. We thank all of them for their opinions, sometimes strong opinions on how the paper should unfold. We thank the, the way the process works. We had to convince people that we were onto something. We thank the people who pointed out the gaps in our logic because it made our case stronger. We thank the New Mexico Museum and Natural History Foundation and their support through the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We thank the people who manage the land where our fossils were found that we'll talk about, the US Bureau of Reclamation. And most importantly, we thank the support of the Department of Cultural Affairs as we move forward with all of our investigations. Without any further ado, it is my distinct privilege and honor to introduce to you the New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs Cabinet Secretary, Deborah Garcia Grego. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. Thank you for being here this morning for this exciting announcement. I'm honored to be a part of this announcement and I'm also honored to be the cabinet secretary for the department, which represents the largest state run museum system in the country. <clears throat> and frankly, discoveries like this showcase the level of subject matter expertise that staff across the department maintain in their respective fields, from folk art to history to paleontology and beyond. The work ensures that our museums and historic sites are not static, that they remain hubs of ongoing research, innovation, and education that continually reshape our understanding of our state's important artistic, cultural, and scientific heritage. Moreover, this discovery demonstrates our commitment to collaborate with respected national and international partners. This discovery was made in New Mexico, but as Dr. Fiorillo highlighted, it embraced collaboration with partners in three different states, the District of Columbia, two foreign countries, and two continents, excuse me, three foreign countries and two continents. Across the department, the spirit of inquiry and collaboration leads to significant exhibits, discoveries by renowned scientists, and partnerships with cultural and scientific organizations throughout New Mexico, the nation, and the world. Discoveries expand our collective knowledge while ensuring our exhibits and our museums are not static. They build important economic impact by attracting repeat visitors and out of state and out of country travelers to our cultural institutions. 
This helps in fueling New Mexico's $741 million nonprofit arts and cultural industries and supporting over 10,000 jobs statewide. And so for all of those reasons and many more, we're grateful to all of the work of Dr. Fiorillo and every partner who worked on the research behind this groundbreaking discovery. And we are also deeply indebted to the staff of the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, whose work every day helps make important discoveries like this possible. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Secretary. Um, you will hear from two other members of the team. And uh, you heard me introduce myself as the executive director, the, which I am, and, but I get to wear two uniforms. I wear the executive director uniform and I wear the scientist uniform, which is why I'm wearing a sport jacket with blue jeans, just so you know. So I'm gonna mix those two roles a little bit. This is an exciting day for the museum, for me personally, and the rest of our research team. Um, we'll get into some of the details, but this is a discovery literally decades in the making. So it, it was, um, the specimens we're about to look at were found some 30 years ago. So we are indebted to the people who initially found the fossils and the members of this museum who have now moved on to other roles in their lives, who were involved in the excavation of those bones. So we are indebted to those first, the first wave of people who collected things. At the time, because 30 some years ago, as you'll see, they found a big toothy thing. And at that time, 30 to 35 years ago, the fossil record of Tyrannosaurus was not as robust as it is today. Tyrannosaurus rex, I have to be clear on that distinction from now on. Um, so these fossils were first recognized and called Tyrannosaurus rex. But science is a process. With each new discovery, it forces us to go back and test and challenge what we thought we knew. And that's the story, the core story of this project is that it took 30 years, but it's part of the process of moving forward with new interpretations. The secretary used the word innovation. You'll hear from the person, Sebastian Dahlman, who actually started the process, who looked at some of these materials and said, huh, this doesn't look right. And from that moment, he started to build a case that more and more of us believed. And then from there, the project grew. To me, this discovery underscores the value of the reason why this museum holds such large collections. These are, um, we have the largest collection, paleontological collection in the entire southwestern United States, you have to go all the way to Los Angeles to find the next closest collection of our size. Um, as you know, what's on display, and this is true of all museums, what you see on display is just the tip of the iceberg. We have over 110,000 specimens across the street where researchers around the world come, look at what we have, and put it within the context of their research questions and so on. So it's a very dynamic um, collection and facility. And as a result of that, we are the stewards of New Mexico's natural heritage. And we're very proud of that. And we take that very seriously. It doesn't mean everything's under lock and key, but it does mean we take our role as stewards very seriously. These collections provide the basis for so much work behind the scenes. From research on New Mexico jumping mouse populations to things like we're talking about today. Um, 
as we gather more data and re revisit each hypothesis, um, researchers come to uh, take our specimens and they have their conclusions as they see fit. Um, almost right on cue, they're a little late. The, the point of all of this is that we are here to foster an environment of curiosity that encourages scientific inquiry from very early age. As you probably are aware, in general, the public, not just unique to the United States, but the public distrusts science. And it's our job to convey the process as well as the facts and figures of science so that the next generation, which right now is down in our atrium, will come up, come to this museum and others like it and understand why we think we know what we say we know. And so our job is to foster that curiosity for future generations. So if we're successful, you can hear that they're excited. Then we know that our industry, our profession, our curiosity will be in good hands. What I will say is I have this position today as a professional scientist and museum director, and my path to this microphone right now started when I was about that age, and my grandmother took me to a natural history museum, and I never outgrew that. So when you see these kids, you can ask yourself which one of them is going to have my job someday in the future. You're a winner. Come on up here. All right. What's your name? Lily, what's your name? Jordan. Jordan, why don't you come over here? You guys and Lily, why don't you come over here? And what you're going to do is help us unveil the jaw of the new dinosaur. So why don't you grab this part of the clock? You ready, Jordan? On the count of three, why don't you walk back this way and pull the cloth off? One, two, three. Thank you, Lily, for your help. Thank you, Jordan, for your help. So you guys are the first, among the first, to see the, the official jaw of the new dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus mcclayensis. So there's a little piece of artwork there. That's very helpful with this. Sally, here's the larger version of the artwork of Mexico. Do we know if Nick is on? Somebody said something? Yeah. He is? All right. Um, there are three people that you're going to hear from now. One is uh, Dr. Nick Longridge, who is coming to us. His position is at the University of Bath in England. And he will uh, talk about some of the reasons why he came all the way from England to this museum to study our fossils and how this study changes our understanding of tyrannosaurs as a group in North, in, um, North America. Uh, all right. Yeah. Fire away, I guess. What do you want to know? What do you want to talk about here? Nick, Nick tell us, Nick. tell us why you came here. Uh, you know, Hey, it, it's a, it's a new Tyrannosaurus species. You don't get to name one of those every day. Uh, not even maybe necessarily once in your career. It's a pretty exciting thing to find a, a new species of giant Tyrannosaur. And, you know, to really, I, I kind of got involved with the project doing a lot of work initially off of photographs, but I felt like to really understand the thing, I had to come and see it and handle the bones and look at them and, and figure out everything in detail and and see the original thing. And uh, it's really important to just kind of get your hands dirty and go back to the data. And so, I yeah, I, I came down to the museum and spent a few days just like looking over every inch of those bones and photographing them and making sure we had everything right. So it's just... Yeah, it's important in science to make sure you have your observations correct. So I needed to come to the museum and, and check it out. And it was just, yeah, it's a really exciting 
uh, a really exciting find. Would you elaborate a little bit on the sort of broad significance of this contribution to what we know about Tyrannosaurus? Yeah, so so T. rex, it's in some ways it's incredibly well known. I mean, we have dozens of skeletons of this animal, uh, you know, from multiple states, and you know, we have them in Canada, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and Montana, and the Dakotas, and Wyoming. So we have a lot of individuals of this thing, uh, but we for a long time we just haven't really known where it came from. So we have these kind of smaller, more primitive Tyrannosaurus, things like Albertosaurus and, and Dasplitosaurus, and they they disappear, and then T. rex shows up kind of out of nowhere, this giant, massive, highly specialized animal that comes to dominate uh, at the end of the age of dinosaurs. It's one of the last dinosaurs on earth. And it's kind of in some ways, sort of like their, their swan song. You know, it's, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest terrestrial predators of all time. So where does it come from? And for a long time, it, it one of the closest relatives we had was this thing called Tarbosaurus from Mongolia. So that raised the possibility that maybe it's coming all the way from Asia across the Bering Land Bridge via Alaska. Uh, but, you know, Tarbosaurus is not quite as big as or specialized. So it's still, and it still leaves a gap of several million years. And then it turns out that, you know, we sort of had the answer all along. Uh, we had some, we had an, uh, an older, more primitive Tyrannosaur in museum collections. It was collected decades ago. We just didn't know what it was. And it was in the process of working on another dinosaur at the museum, uh, Sierra Ceratops. We started rethinking the age of this formation, its fauna. We started looking into it and saying, well, actually, this everyone's assumed this is a T-Rex equivalent fauna, in part because of this jaw they thought was T-Rex. And if we actually start poking at this and looking at it, what do the radiometric dates tell us? What do the fossils tell us? Well, we actually don't have any evidence that this is T-Rex equivalent in age. And the, the evidence points towards an older age. And then together with the, the observations that, that Sebastian had made about the morphology, we started talking about, it. it's like, okay, we, we think we have something much older and more primitive here. And what it tells us is that these giant tyrannosaurs, uh, the tyrannosaurus lineage, uh, the reason why we don't see it up in Montana or Alberta is it, it, didn't, it didn't evolve there. It's evolving down south in the American Southwest or possibly down in Mexico is where we have the, the kind of epicenter of tyrannosaur evolution. And these giants are evolving down there. And at the very end, they kind of move out of the Southwest up into the Northern States. And that's why we've, we just, we've been looking in the wrong place all along. Uh, the origin of these things is not up in Montana. It's down here in New Mexico and Mexico. I introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Spencer Lucas, <laughs> excuse me, who was really key in putting Sebastian on the project in the first place, but um, also to be uh, give you the geologic context of our specimen and the history of these fossils in more detail. So with um, Dr. Lucas is on staff here. He is one of our curators in geosciences. So I welcome Dr. Lucas to come to the microphone. Yeah, you know, one, one thing that amazes me, Tony already alluded to this, is there are nine authors on this paper. And in my experience, if you put nine paleontologists in front of a fossil, you're going to get at least 10 opinions. So it's, it really is amazing we all agreed on this. Anyway, let me talk about two things Tony mentioned. First, the history of the fossil, which he talked about a little. This fossil was originally found by members of the public. It wasn't found by scientists or paleontologists like me. And these were people who lived in Las Cruces. They were boating on Elephant Butte Reservoir. This was in 1983. They landed on the Eastern shore of the lake and a big chunk of this jaw here was lying on the ground. And fortunately for the museum and for science, they brought it to the attention of the museum. And you know that's, an, that's a really big deal to me because we live in a huge state that's very rural. We have a lot of people who live on the land, they farm, they ranch. And we have a lot of people who hike and fish and camp and travel. So people see things all the time in the you know, countryside of New Mexico. And what we want everyone to do when they find something like this, even if they're not sure what it is, they want, we want them to contact this museum or one of the universities and bring it to the attention of scientists so that we can decide what, if anything, needs to be done with it. Now, after the fossil was brought to the attention of the museum, museum staff, and some of you know I've been here forever, right? But this actually predates me. This was before I was hired. 
museum staff went back to the locality, found more of the fossil, and then again went in the uh, 1990s and found even more. And I will tell you that I went to the locality about 10 years ago and I didn't find any fossils. So <clears throat> I think we picked everything up, so we have it all. So it has this long history of having been here. And like Tony said, what we knew about Tyrannosaurus rex in the 1980s was very small compared to what we know about T-Rex now. So looking at it again, as Sebastian did, and then the whole group did, we're looking at it through new eyes, through a lot more knowledge than was available in the 80s. Now, another thing that I was asked to talk about, and Nick alluded to this, is what is the geologic age of this fossil? When it was first found, oh, it's T-Rex. And we assume, therefore, it's the same geologic age as other T-Rex. And T-Rex lives in a very narrow geologic time interval from about 66 to maybe as old as 68 million during that 2 million year interval. That's where all T-Rex fossils come from. But it turns out in the years since, we've, uh, not just us, but working particularly with some of the geologists at NMSU and Las Cruces, we found volcanic ash beds in the rocks that have this fossil, and we were able to get numerical ages. And with those numerical ages now, we can be pretty sure that this fossil is about 72 to 73 million years old. So that means it's about 5 million years older than any T-Rex, which isn't an ironclad argument for saying it's a new species, but you have to ask yourself, could a species like T-Rex have persisted for 5 million years? Why wouldn't there perhaps be an older uh, species of, T of Tyrannosaurus, not T-Rex, but in this case, Tyrannosaurus macraensis, living in that older time interval? So that opens up a lot of questions, which we can talk about later. Is this the ancestor of T-Rex? What is this telling us about the origin of T-Rex? It didn't necessarily originate in, in Mongolia. It may have originated in Southern North America. And so uh, what's good about it is this, uh, any good piece of science should raise more questions than it answers. And, and this does just that. It answers some questions and it raises uh, a lot of others. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, it's also my pleasure to introduce to you the lead author on this project. And how many of you guys in the front rows want to find the dinosaur? Wow, there you go. I'm a little hesitant, but that's all right. Um, you heard me say that I'm in this, I'm at this microphone because my job's I went to a museum when I was about your age and I never left. The lead author of this project said pretty much the same thing to me while Dr. Lucas was speaking. He got introduced to dinosaurs when he was about six years old and he never left. So without any more comments from me, it's my pleasure to introduce the lead author, the guy who actually started this process, who is finishing his PhD at Montana State University so he soon he will be Dr. Dahlman, but Sebastian Dahlman, it, um, my pleasure to come on up to the microphone and tell us about what led you down this path. Okay, thank you all for coming. So I'm the lead author, and I started working on this on this project in 2013 when I saw actually first time I saw this uh, entry, the lower jaw, and what was striking for this actually is most of the uh, more, uh, details are on. The, the other side of dentry. So if you, after you can actually look at them. But uh, what was striking for uh, with this one is that uh, the dentry itself is not expanded uh, ventrally, which is this end. And then also I was looking at the teeth and most of the, I was, as I was, I mentioned, uh, most of the details on the medial side, which is the, the, the inside of the jaw. And after this, I was able to see when I came to uh, New Mexico, because I used to live in Massachusetts, so I'm in New Mexico. And then uh, I was looking at other uh, the bones, such as the postorbital that is here, that forms the, the back of the orbit. And I noticed that there is a, in T-Rex, there is an absent, I mean, there is a large uh, ridge uh, present right here on the top of, uh, of the eye, right here. And this one is actually is just, represented by a small bump. But this is the size of a T-Rex, this post-orbital, and that's why it kind of led me to uh, suggest that this is something new. This is not a T-Rex, 
And when we get the dates, as Dr. Lucas uh, mentioned, that it's about 73, 74 million years. So this confirmed that this is a new species. And I was excited to actually to invite other researchers and uh, continue this project on a larger scale. And that was that was it. I was actually also happy to see the kids because I was six years old. I was like your, your age almost <laughs> when I got into dinosaurs. So I'm, hopefully one of you will become, will follow my footsteps. <laughs> Thank you. So um, that pretty much concludes the formal part of the, the, the event. I would just elaborate a little bit. Um, how many of you guys have seen Jurassic Park? Okay. Talking about that jaw, well, you just heard about that jaw to put it in perspective. Um, Tyrannosaurus is a big bone chewing, jeep crunching dinosaur from Jurassic Park, Tyrannosaurus rex. The more slender jaw here means that it might have been a bone chewing, fiat crunching dinosaur <laughs> instead of a jeep. Anyway, with that, uh, we're, we're happy to um, entertain any questions, follow up from what we've talked about or anything in general about dinosaurs if, you, if you've got them. So um, thank you for coming. You guys have any questions? No? Are you gonna just save them all for your teacher when you get back to the room? Okay. Well, um, where's the teacher? I'll be sure to give you my business card so you can, you can get a hold of us. If there are no questions, oh, there, there's... The, can, can we can we state the full name? The name is Tyrannosaurus macraeensis. So it's the genus Tyrannosaurus that we all know, but now there's this new species macraeensis. And I don't know if we've touched on this, but the name comes from the rock unit where these bones came from. There's a number of ways people name things. And in this case, it's from the rock unit. Is there another question? What creates a new species? Um, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, as, as Spencer referenced, nine people on a paper will give you 10 opinions. So the fact that there was consensus here was um, was actually pretty solid. And Sebastian uh, identified a couple of features on this on these bones. And what it is is it's um, when you find something, your first question is, well, your first thing is cool. the The next thing is, what is it? And then you start to look at, how what you found compares to what's known. And Sebastian articulated, there's things in the jaw, there's things in over the eye that are different. And then you start digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And then those differences, if they're consistent and you don't find, oh, it's just like so-and-so, that's when you start the conversation about, you might have something new. Oh, I'll direct that one to you. Um, not much. The, the fossil was preserved in mudstone, in clay. So it was actually very easy to prepare. So there wasn't a lot of work in the area. Question. Yeah, I the paper is published right now. The embargo lifted 40 minutes ago. So the paper is publicly accessible. It's in a journal called Scientific Reports and it's a nature publication and it's open access, which means 
if you guys are really curious about the, the pictures that might be with this thing and want to read the actual technical paper, just get to your computer terminal and you can access the paper freely. It's one of the reasons why we chose open access so everybody can access the original data and make their own opinions. You know, there, there's, there's about a half dozen more bones of the skull. So all that we found was part of the skull and the lower jaw. We didn't find any of the body, none of the limb bones or vertebrae. So we only brought these two bones over because they're the most easy, I think, to understand. But the rest of the bones are over in the collection. We have about 25% of the skull, but we don't have any of the body. Another question from the chat? <laughs> um, not yet. We um, <clears throat> for more, although if, if, I don't know how to answer that. No. <laughs> yes. Well, with those great big teeth, you can probably guess that it, um, Do those teeth look like you what, you eat steak at home? Do those teeth look like your steak knife? So yes, this guy probably ate whatever he wanted to. <laughs> Excuse me, or girl, I don't know. There's Tyrannosaurus rex for sure, and Tyrannosaurus macraensis for sure. And then there's some others that um, are still being debated. The closest relative of Tyrannosaurus, by the way, is actually something called Tarbosaurus, and that's from Central Asia. So we've talked a little, Nick talked a little bit about um, communication between Asia and North America with dinosaurs. But if you compare the anatomy of Tyrannosaurus with Tarbosaurus, they're very, very similar, but there are some differences. Tyrannosaurus is solidly North American and Tarbosaurus is solidly Asian. There's another, another question. The question was, what are some of the differences between this dinosaur and Tyrannosaurus rex? And like Sebastian pointed out, the jaws are thinner instead of big and robust. And that's not trivial. That's not just something because the shape of the jaw tells you that the animal ate differently than Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurus rex had big jaws that probably were capable of crunching up bones of all sizes as it consumed its meal. This dinosaur, may have been crunching up bones, but they may have been smaller bones because the jaw is more slender. So it didn't have the power of the bite of a big Tyrannosaurus. And then this bone is a bone that's right here over your eye. And on Tyrannosaurus rex, there's a ridge that may have been used as a display structure like deer use antlers. Um, but on our dinosaur, that ridge isn't there or it's very, very subtle. So it's another way, and those ridges are ways animals communicate. So our animal ate differently and communicated differently based on what we see in these two bones, okay? Yeah. Tyrannosaurus belongs to a group of dinosaurs called Tyrannosaurs. And there's a whole bunch of Tyrannosaurs including things like the Asian relative Tarbosaurus, which was about as big as Tyrannosaurus and looked a lot very, very similar to Tyrannosaurus. But there was also a whole bunch of them. One of the weird things about Tyrannosaurus is the first ones were actually quite small. 
not great big 40 foot animals, but they're actually pretty small. But there are, um, do you guys know how many taxa there are of tyrannosaurs? So there might be at least 12 different kinds of tyrannosaurs, but this is one of the biggest ones. That's where that was. And then as Spencer alluded to, there were um, subsequent trips out there and those went into what the early nineties, early to mid nineties to make sure that they'd gotten everything. That's part of it. I mean, part of it is in the 1980s, the number of Tyrannosaurus rex skeletons, you could probably count on one hand. And then since that time, there's been intense interest in Tyrannosaurus. And as a result of that, the data, the more discoveries have been made, the database has grown. And so that's why I said, this is part of the scientific process with all these new discoveries and we know no, more about Tyrannosaurus rex anatomy, so on and so on, it was time to go back and revisit these specimens. And that's when Sebastian said, hold on guys, we got something new. And that's just part of the process as the database grows. Yeah. McRae ensis comes from the rock unit that this was found in called the McRae group. Who McCray was? Spencer, do you have any idea? Captain McCray, I know who Captain McCray was. Captain Mono. McCray was a Union soldier. He was an artillery officer. He died in the Battle of Valverde Crossing. When some of you remember, the Texans thought they could take New Mexico. Ha ha, right? And they and an army mar marched up from El Paso. And of course, you've all heard of the Battle of Glorieta, where they were ultimately pushed back. But there was a big battle south of Socorro at a place called Valverde. There's a, there's a national monument there now called the Fort, uh, Fort Craig. And McCray died in the battle. He was one of the heroes of the battle. So they named, uh, after the Civil War, they named a fort, Fort McCray. And there was a fort, uh, it would have, it was, there was no Elephant Butte Reservoir until around the time of the First World War. But that fort would have been east of the river. And so when we name rock formations, we name them, we give them place names. So that rock, McCray Group, that was originally McCray Formation, was named after Fort McCray. Fort McCray was named after Captain McCray. And it, it's a fascinating story, Captain McCray, but enough. <laughs> so thanks to your question, we've now tied our dinosaur to the Civil War. How's that? Yeah. Yes. It, well, it's it's on federally managed land, and that's as secure as it gets. Anybody could actually, I guess, walk out there and wander around because it's public land. Now, it's not easy to get to. It's it's on the eastern shore of Elephant Butte Lake, and the lake, as you know, has receded. So it's actually now about half a mile from the water. It's in the middle of nowhere, and we don't reveal the actual location data you know, to the public. We keep it in our database and somebody who has legitimate research interests could get that information. So yeah, you'd have to accidentally find it in a way no one that's published exactly where it is. That's a great question. The question was, and just so you guys know, all of your questions have been great, but let's focus on this one. Um, from these fragments, how do you understand the, the picture that's on your card? And it's because these are close enough in many ways to Tyrannosaurus rex. So because we don't have the body of this animal, we are making the assumption that the body was similar to Tyrannosaurus rex. And so, we make certain assumptions, but when you get to the parts you actually have, that's where you tweak what the animal looked like, and that's why you have the picture you have. Uh, this is actually uh, based on the just a dent this one bond entry. Uh, it's almost close as as one of the largest uh, 
Tyrannos uh, T Rex specimens. So it's approaching this the size of so like I would say in the metrics it's gonna be about twelve meters long, something like that. So it's yeah, those of us that measure things still in feet, that would be about forty feet. Long. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We'll take you and then you, okay? That is correct, that these, what you're looking at is we have one individual of Tyrannosaurus macrayensis today. Tomorrow we might have two, depending on what you guys do in your free time over the weekend. And, and then you had a question? Well, I, I wasn't part of the excavation and neither were any of these guys, but the initial find was exposed at the surface. And so maybe you can um, elaborate a little bit on the nature of the follow-up expeditions. I think the actual follow-up exca excavations only took about a day or two on, on two different occasions because there wasn't a lot. And, you know, it's interesting because all you've really got is part of the skull. Where's the rest of this animal? What happened to all the rest of its body? Which is always an interesting question that not easy to answer. Thanks. Um, well, you can see all the cracks in them, so they have to be handled very carefully. It took um, at least three people to put this jaw on this into this case yesterday. It's it's not, you know, I don't, I've not actually weighed it. It's not super super heavy, but it's super super fragile. So all those hands are helpful to keep it from breaking. These guys are available for any additional questions. Um, so we're gonna wrap things up now. You guys can see the rest of the museum and hopefully push buttons and learn cool stuff. And thank you all for coming.